Thank you. Class 132. The hat tells you a lot about the person who's wearing the hat. There is a huge amount that you can judge just by looking at the hat. So here you can see four pictures, pictures of four men wearing hats. And even without me telling you any more about it, you already know the time period, the likely country, and the class of those people. So you can tell straight away that where we're looking at these people, they're in Victorian England. You can tell that these people are from the upper class, the middle class, the merchant class, and working class. And you can tell all of that from their hats. So the hat is a really important part of the outfit. I mean, it completes the outfit, but it also says a lot about who you are. So when you're wanting to make a hat, think about that in relation to the rest of the outfit. Let's have a look at some of the hat types from 16th century Spain. There is the sombrero. The sombrero was, although now it's used to mean all hats, when in the time period we're talking about, the term meant a wide brimmed hat, sombrero, so it's shade from the sun. So a wide brimmed hat could have been made of straw, palm leaf or felt and some of the royal ones were then covered in lush fabrics. We have simple caps, gorras, or medias gorras, which has a brim or camagnola. So these are simple caps, and you can see that these were probably made of felt. Sometimes they were made of wool and then knitted and then felted. We have the gora or the bonnet. This comes in several different forms. You can see a Flemish style, which is the style where mostly what you're seeing is the brim. You can see more of a flat cap style. And again, these were often knitted and filtered of wool. And in fact, there is um, some information in Anderson about the civilian guild who made these hats and how it took so many years in order to be able to call yourself a master of that guild and it went through all of the processes to make these hats. For the upper ranks, of course, these could also be made of velvet. We also have Gora Alta, tall hats. You can see that these hats are made over a foundation. That foundation might be felt or it might be pasted paper. And they were covered then in velvet or in silk taffeta or even in fine leather. There are other kinds of hats as well. I'm not talking about those because what I'm going to focus on is on constructed hats, but the ones that you see most often in addition to these types are the rollo, which is like a padded roll covered in patterned fabric, sometimes worn under another kind of hat, or the escoffia, a call or a net, which is, can be embroidered, can be woven, can be netted, can even be macrame and again, you see those mostly being worn by men, sometimes also by women, and sometimes also under another hat. So when we're looking at this art, we can make assumptions about the materials that they're made of. So some of these headwares are made of fabric, some are made of straw, they can even be covered in feathers. I admit I haven't been able to find a Spanish example, this is an Italian example. They can be knitted and felted, as I mentioned before. They may be formed out of felt, or they can be made out of a mixture of materials. So this has a firm understructure and then a silk brocade outer layer. So consider when you're looking at this, are they constructed out of a single layer or are perhaps they constructed out of multiple layers? And also have a look at how many layers there are in the whole ensemble. The guy with the feathers, for example, is wearing a coif underneath, a, a hood underneath his hat. Here is a picture, not Spanish, but it contains a bunch of people all at the same time and place, and they're wearing different kinds of hats. So let's have a look at the materials. This hat here looks like it's made out of linen. This one here looks like it's made out of woolen fabric, which has just been gathered up together. Oh, 
And I've just pressed the wrong button. Hang on. Where's my share screen gone? Right, let's get back to this slide. This one here is made of feathers. You can see that feathery effect, which is amazing. And these ones here are formed out of felt. And you can see that they are round or possibly wool and then felted down, but they're not sewn. They don't have those seam lines in them. These two, are a foundation with a covering on the outside. Here we have another example, and this of course is a Spanish one, it's a Coela painting. These two ladies aren't wearing hats at all, they're wearing appropriately dressed hair, and I know that one of the other classes this weekend is on dressing hair. These two gentlemen are wearing hats that are made out of formed felt. This gentleman and lady are wearing hats where there's a foundation and then velvet covering over the top. And these two are in a different style, so not the tall hat, but the, the flatter hat. Also, a foundation at least for the brim and then fabric. Excuse, so me, excuse me, Rowan. Um, yes. We had just a question from about the um, the previous slide to this, uh, the, the kind of one of the, the greed hat on the left that was that was highlighted, um, and whether you think that might be a thrum hat or it looks a bit like a thrum hat. Uh, I was, the one uh, that you I, said was feathers, I think. Uh, I know that it's feathers um, for, because of another reason. It could be a thrum hat, but thrum hats are normally um, are much taller. They're, they're not made flat. The examples are all very tall. Uh, like a sugar cone sort of effect. Thanks. But yes, they, I mean, uh, the thrums would be represented in a similar way. That is certainly true. If it was a tall hat with those stripes on, I would think it was a thumb cap. Okay, the key points I want to make at this point is the hat should match the rest of the outfit. It should be the same time period, the same country, the same class. That's how you get the whole outfit. Base your hats on extant examples, but they're very rare, or on period art. Don't base them on what other people are wearing. If you copy something that somebody else has made, it becomes like Chinese whispers. It's your version of their version of something that they once saw on Pinterest. It may not actually be a very good representation. Consider the options for suitable hats. So when you're looking for a hat to go with your outfit, have a look at all of the kinds of hats that were worn within that country, within that class for that time. And then consider out of that group of hats, which ones do you have the skills to make? So I don't have any skills to make knitted hats. So I don't, I don't try and make a knitted hat out of something else. I talk to a friend who makes beautiful knitted hats. What I want to focus on for the rest of this time is constructed hats, which are the ones that are the easiest ones for people to make who don't have specialised skills like knitting or like forming felt hats. So that's what I want to talk about. The foundations of these hats, as I mentioned before, might be felt. That could be flat felt or it could be moulded felt, or they might be pasted paper an early form of cardboard, or really a bit like papier-mâché made out of layers, which is itself moulded on a form. They have multiple coverings that might be velvet or silk or taffeta or fine leather. It could even be wool, but that these kind of hats mostly seem to be in the upper class. And they usually had linen linings. You occasionally see silk linings also. And think about also the embellishments. So there's embroidery, there are narrow wares, braise and passementaire, there are jewellery and feathers. Let's have a look at some of those in a bit more detail. So here I've got goros, bonetes, and here are four pictures and you can see that there is a remarkable similarity between the men's hats and women's hats for this time and for this class. 
they appear to be uniformly black velvet. Um, and you can see that the decoration tends to gold or gold with pearls and feathers. Here are some tool hats. And again, you can see that there are some real similarities here, different pictures. The two on the left, um, Philip in two different poses by two different portraits, is wearing a hat which certainly on the left appears to be black velvet and indeed the black velvet has been used again as the decoration. The middle one probably is also black velvet, could be silk, it's a, it's a harder sort of look. The one on the right certainly is black velvet. So the first point here, the first thing that we need to do, having found the hat of our dreams that exactly fits our outfits, is to get your reference material together. And the one big tip that I've got here is do not try and work from your pictures on a phone. You need it on a much bigger scale. You can't afford to have a small picture that disappears every time you try and do something with it. Print it out as large as possible, A3, A4, and if you're working across multiple hats, using elements of all of them, of similar hats, print them all out and work from them. Because you're going to want to be measuring things on them, looking at proportions, all of those things which are much easier to do on a piece of paper. The next important tip is to work with a head form. A head form is not a hat block. A head form is a head shape. And it you can buy them cheaply and you need to pad it up to the right size so that it matches your size or the size of the person you're making the hats for. Now I have made a video on how to pad up a head form. Um, I had originally planned to play it in this class but it turned out to be too long so I will be sending through a link afterwards of the way that you can get access to that video. Then build the pattern in heavy paper or light card. You want something that's got some stiffness for the stiff elements. For the fabric elements, consider the weight and the drape of the fabric that you plan to use and use test fabric that is similar. So you don't want to be making a hat using something that's um, floppy like velvet and do your test in something that's really stiff because you won't be able to get a similar feel. Another point is look for layers. Complex hats might be made up of simpler pieces. So I mentioned before that there was the man who was wearing the hood and then he was wearing the hat on top. And indeed I'm wearing a multi-layered hat. So complex hats are often made up of multiple layers. If that's the case, make the bottom layers first before you make the one on top. Work on a head form of the right size. I mentioned that before. And another important point is, if you are planning on wearing dressed hair under the hat, then you need to simulate that dressed hair on the head form. So you need to put fake wigs or some uh, plaited wool under a, a, um, a hairnet or something to pad up the form so that it also has the braided circle in the place that you have it. Otherwise your hat won't fit. When you're working, consider the thickness of the covering materials. So if you're covering a hat in something that's very thick, don't make it the foundation too small or it'll be too small once you've covered it. And spend your time on the pattern. Spend your time getting the pattern right and then you can enjoy making the hat knowing that it will fit. Again, I have another video that I've made on how to pattern, how, how to make the patterns using the light card. And again, I'd planned to show that in this, but realized it was going to be too long. What I want to do now, uh, I should probably pause at this point and ask Kirill if there are any other questions. We did have one question, which is a bit earlier. Um, on, uh, well, uh, very early, uh, on, a, on hats with tassels. And with, there was a hat in, the, I think, your first slide, which had, had tassels on it, and, or, or not your first, but very early slide, which had tassels on it, and wondered if you had an idea of what the tassels were made of. Um, 
Oh, that, that will be the tassels on the sombrero. Uh, there, there was a sombrero out of the Trachenbuch and it had tassels on it. I think the, well, you've only got a few options. If you consider the materials that were available in period, those tassels would have been made of wool or they would have been made of silk. Those would be the most likely choices out of that. Um, so I think it would depend on the status of the person who was wearing the hat. If it was a, a well-off person, they may be silk tassels, wool tassels would also be appropriate. Thanks. That's the only question I have looming at the moment. Thank you. So now I'm going to walk you through a case study. And this was a hat that I made for Duke Gabriel de Beaumont um, before he and Mistress Constancia went off for their Spanish adventure. He has an enormous head. She sent me this photo as inspiration. So what I knew about it was really the image and the information attached to it. So I knew when the hat came from, which is about 1610. I knew that it had a leather and cardboard structure underneath and that the outside layer was leather, velvet and silk and that it had cord applique and thread and it had a linen lining. So I started the process of making this hat. The first stage was to pattern it up in stiff paper. And here's a picture of the paper pattern resting on the head form and you can kind of see underneath instead of hair, he has multiple layers of felt, which is what I've used to make the head form bigger. And as I mentioned earlier, I have a, um, a film on how to, how to do this. The next task was to cut out the pieces from felt. Now I'm using a flat, fairly stiff, three mil thick felt. It's basically a furnishing felt. I think it's probably used on pin boards and the like. And it makes an excellent, easy to get for us um, source of felt for these hats. You, you need something that's not craft felt. Craft felt is too soft and it's too floppy and it's not thick enough. So you're looking for something that's a bit thicker and stiff. Having cut those out of the pattern, I'm now doing a test crown, a, a test fit on the crown and the brim. So I'm just pinning these together and checking the fit. Now I've taken my cylinder and I'm sewing the centre back seam. I'm using a heavy waxed linen thread and I'm sewing the seam up and then sewing it back down again to make sure that it's strong. Now I'm whip stitching the brim onto the crown of the hat. And now I'm whip stitching the tip onto the top of the hat. And there we go. Now I have a foundation hat, which is complete. The next thing is that the brim I thought needed a bit of stiffening. So I used a commercial stiffener for the brim. And while that worked, it's a really uh, nasty chemical to use. And since then, I've done a lot of experiments with other stiffeners. And the best one I've come up with is rabbit skin glue, which I use in a one to 10 proportion and heat up in a water bath. And that works brilliantly. It's non-toxic, it's a period material, it's cheap. Um, however, it doesn't keep very well. You just have to make up the amount you need for the hat. Now, having completed my foundation, I'm moving on to the covering. So here, I'm using the pattern, the brim, to cut out the brim covering. Now, don't cut out the inner circles. This is a really important point. We'll do that later. For now, just I'm just cutting the outside. And now I'm basting the brim to the surface of the felt. This is the underneath. So I'm basting it using large stitches all around the outside and then trimming off the excess on the inside. Now I'm turning it over and now it's safely secured around the outside. I'm marking the opening, which I can feel in the foundation felt and then I'm cutting that out with a bit of a seam allowance. And then turning that up into the hat. This is so much easier than trying to play with the donut. You'll never get the donut cut in the right way. I've used a water soluble glue to just stick the, the tabs of the seam allowance up. 
much easier than trying to sew on the inside face of that circle. Now, the next step is I'm binding the cord around the outside and I've unraveled the cord in order to twist it back up so that you don't see the join at all. Now I've put on the upper brim here and I had to cut a hole in the, that before I could slide it over and I've smoothed that out and now I'm sewing the gold braid on, which is covering that join. Now I'm covering the tip. I've cut out the tip with a bit of extra seam allowance because you do see a little bit of the top at the side and I'm securing that to the foundation with a catch stitch. Now I've taken the pattern um, and I'm using that for the silk band. It's the pattern for the silk band that goes around the outside. And here you can see I've pinned the silk, pin fitted the silk band on it to check where I need to seam it before putting it on. Around the outside of the hat, there are these triangles which are on the outside of the silk. So in order to make perfect triangles, I've cut myself a template in cardboard and I'm using that to iron the velvet over the top of so that I get perfect triangles. And now I'm sewing, sewing on the gold um, highlights on those triangles. This was really interesting when I had a good look at the picture. These were made from an enormous chain stitch. So that was, that was what I did. And then each one also has a, a spider web embroidered on it. Well, multiple spider webs getting smaller to the top, which I embroidered. This is the kind of work that I would normally do in a frame. But because I needed these triangles already with the edges turned and so on, I couldn't do that. So what I've done is to pin it into the edge of my, uh, my ironing board and use that to tension. And that's a really easy way of sewing straight lines. Here you can see that I've put those triangles onto the hat on the outside and you can see the spider webs as well. And I'm basting them in place around the crown just to keep them in position. I needed a three color cord to go around the edge of the hat band and I just could not find one in the right colors. So what I've done is that I found a cord that had two of the right colors and I've just unraveled one of them and then put a replacement from a similar weight cord to make the colors that I needed. And now I'm sewing that around the edge of the hat band. And here you can see the hat with the band on it and now what I'm doing is to make a pattern for the shield that goes at the front and that hides the seam in the hat band. I've now made that shield so I've cut it out of felt and covered it in velvet and put the cord around the outside and now I'm sewing it on the hat to hide that seam. On the top there's a button two layers in black leather. So I've dyed the leather, burnished the edges and punched holes with the awl and now I'm threading those through with the gold using a, um, a, a blunt end needle. And now I'm using those same holes to sew it onto the top of the hat. And now here's the hat which I've lined in unbleached linen. And having done that, and I was very happy with the hat, in preparing for this event, um, I got sent uh, some pictures by uh, Doña Mariana, and she had taken some photos of this hat in Spain on the trip that they made there. And when I saw those pictures, I realized that there were many aspects of this hat that I had not understood from the single picture that I had. This picture that she took side on, you can see, I've captured a lot of it, but what I didn't realize from the photo that I had was the brim is not flat, it curves up. I could have done that, but I didn't realize it was how the hat was made. And also it has strings coming from the hat that would have, that were under the chin with a kind of a, a covered knot to hold it on the head. 
again, I could have done that, I didn't have that information. So the version of the hat that I've done is a great version of the picture that I had, but there was much more about the hat that I didn't realize. So here is the hat um, in the picture and the version of the hat that I made. And I'm still very happy with it. It's still a very nice hat and it did make Duke Gabriel look even taller than he already is. So, as I said, I have some, I have, uh, some videos which I'll find a way to share, but for now I thought I would show you some things in person and we could have some more questions. So if this is a good moment for a question. Um, yes. Uh, Dawn asked um, if you had considered putting a sweatband in. Um, I, I did think about it and in fact um, after the event there was a retrofit of a sweatband because I'd been just, a, I, I was so overawed by the size of his head I made it just a little bit big. Um, but the period examples that we've had do not seem to have had, the, the few extant examples that still exist with their linings don't have sweatbands. Um, there is evidence of stitching in some ones where all we've got is the foundation, but it's hard to tell if those stitches along the, um, along the inner edge were from affixing the lining or affixing the covering of the brim or were a sweatband. So I don't think it would be a problem to put in a sweatband and certainly if you're going to wear it a lot and you're likely to sweat, that is a way of not having to reline the hat. Um, Meth asked, if you did that kind of hat again, would you do the embroidery of the overlays before cutting into the triangles so that you could keep them in a frame? Um, um, in fact, I used the embroidery to secure the hem at the same time. And it was, by sewing it under tension as I did, it was actually a very fast process. Um, so I could have done it in a frame and if it was a more elaborate sort of embroidery, then yes, I would have, but just the simple stripe was definitely faster to do just as I did it. Um, okay. Framing up for embroidery takes quite a lot of time. I, I knocked those over in a very short time. So okay. it's more efficient. Um, and somebody asked what the tiny little flower-like ornaments were on the triangles and how you made them. Those are the things that I called the spider webs and they're an Elizabethan stitch and they were very evident on the hat where you basically take an uneven number, you, you make spokes, by, by threading out an uneven number and then you take the same thread and you weave under and over and under and over and under and over around to make yourself a little spider web and that's the ornament that was on the hat and I know it from other Elizabethan sources too. There's been a couple of ask, uh, questions about the material used for the hat um, and Leonor asked if it would be possible that the triangles um, shield might have been made of leather and if a couple of other people um, said the same sort of thing. Uh, is it possible that that's the case? Um, I've gone, I've closed down the window but when you see the picture you can actually see, I think that the, the shield might have been made of leather but it was certainly covered in velvet when, when you saw it. Okay, and um, uh, there's a bit of a, another question about um, the choice of the uh, buckram or the, the, the use of felt. Somebody asked again if you could say again what the felt was that you used. And um, also Illumina Ada asked, asked if what you have, from what you have researched, if buckram is used as an interlining as well. Okay, so that's one of the most interesting things that I've been discovering. I've been making hats for a long time. And the early hats that I made, I made by using buckram and wire, which is, which is a modern theatrical method approach to making hats. And since I taught myself hat making out of a theatrical book, that's how I did it. However, the buckram and wire has two problems. The first is there is no evidence for its use in period. None of the extant examples that we have, uh, whether we've got the, um, the whole hat or just the, the inside, none of the foundations were made of buckram and wire. It just wasn't what they were using. And if you think about it, they were already making felt hats. So if you've already got a felt hat, and this is a felt hat made over a form and stiffened, then that is a much easier, much more substantial, much better thing to use as a foundation and then to lay your fancy fabric over. 
than to make something out of buckram and wire. The second problem with buckram and wire is this is the foundation of just one of those sorts of hats, one that I made my husband, Master Nico, and he wore for many years. And you can see that over time, regardless of how much stiffener you put in it, um, it gets crumpled. And once it's crumpled, you can't fix it. So the Buckman wire is not as successful. This is also more work. So the third advantage of the felt is it's actually easier. Now, if you already make felt hats and you already have the appropriate um, hat blocks and you know how to steam and size and the hats, then this would be the way to do it. And in fact, this was, I mean, they were the formed hats. They weren't sewn up out of felt. But since most people don't have that ability, then, and we have to make our hats, then I would definitely go for felt, making it up in sheet felt rather than making it up in buckram and wire. I'm so much happier with it and it's faster and easier. So the third problem we're talking about is, as I said, it's three millimeters thick and it's quite stiff. So the kind of felt, as I said, that's used for furnishing or for um, putting on the outside of pin boards is the kind of thing that you're looking for. And this provides a really nice balance of stiffness and flexibility, which makes it really ideal for making hats on the scale that we're making. The stiffener that I talked about earlier, I don't know if you can hear this, but this piece I have put the rabbit skin glue size on and it's made it so tough. Um, it's still got a tiny bit of flex in it, which is nice, but it's really strong. I'm really happy with it. I, I did some experiments, you know, bending it and so on. It works really well. However, and I'm sure you can't see this, this is the end of the piece, the, the stuff that I made in order to make these samples. And I forgot about it and left it in the cupboard. And now it has fabulous mold on the top. So it doesn't last forever. Just make up the amount that you need. This felt, uh, if you're making hats out of proper uh, hoods and capolines, that is hatting felt, which is made out of wool or made out of rabbit fur, and you're steaming it and you're putting it over your mold, you can make it any shape you like, including a domed top. With a domed top using this kind of felt, um, it's possible to do. So here is the pattern of a tip that I made where I wanted a domed tip. You can see that it's got these small, slightly curved pieces cut out of it. Not very big, but that makes a beautiful domed tip, which is surprisingly smooth. And once it's covered in the velvet, um, looks just like a formed tip. And although I'm not showing you the video, I can show you, this is a hat form with hoods. So this hat form is not large enough. So I've made a whole series of hoods out of a shape, four sections, sewn together to make the hood. And I've got a whole stack of these so I can make heads of a variety of sizes. The hood is, the, the padded up head form is really important because you can't look at your own head from the back. And if you're making a hat for somebody else, they're gonna be really annoyed if you want them to stand there all the time while you rotate around and make slight decisions in terms of your patterning. So this saves a lot of time. And it means that you can look at the hat from all angles while you're making it constantly referring back to the, the pictures that you've got to make sure that the proportions of the hat are, and the proportions of the face work well, that the angles are exactly what you want. Let's have a look and see if we've got any more questions. 
Just uh, somebody asked about whether the stiffener affected the uh, breathability of the felt. I mean, once you've got the felt and the covering and the lining and so on, you, do, you don't have a lot of breathing anyway. Yes, it does affect the breathability. Having just tried to breathe through this and this one, this is not breathing so much. But again, what they really would have been are these formed hats. Um, and again, once you've formed it up and applied a stiffener of any sort, you're not going to get a lot of breathing happening. I can see um, some other questions in the side. Uh, does wool felt stand up better to crushing than other kinds of hats? Uh, yes, yeah, the, the felt is, is much more solid. The buckram is very subject to wear and that's despite very carefully um, stuffing things into it and making sure that it's not crushed. It's just, uh, the buckram, the other problem with buckram is that if it gets damp at all, it completely goes very soft. So even rain will make it do this over time. And although rain will affect the glue on the felt, it's only if you drop it in a puddle and you leave it there for a long time and you get it warm. So uh, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, as you can probably tell, about the rabbit skin glue option. Anna asked if there, if you had any comments on hats worn under coronets. I guess, yes, it's that continuous problem we have in the SEA where many of us have got shiny hats. And how do you wear a shiny hat when you are wearing a non-shiny hat? <laughs> I think my answer there is look in the art for pictures of people wearing hats under coronets. And the good tip here is look for pictures of the three wise men um, attending the Virgin. Quite often the three wise men are depicted as uh, very high class people and I've seen several examples of formed wool, wool, woolen hats um, or covered hats with a crown then around uh, as kind of the decoration around the brim. So that would be a good place to look. Find a period example of how it's done and go with that. I can see somebody asked a question about colours. Um, are all hats black? No, all hats are not black, but in the 16th century, as I'm sure you know, in the upper classes, black was the most expensive colour. So they tended to wear a lot of black because it was showing off their wealth. And black velvet was a very expensive material. Covering your hat in black velvet was the most expensive thing that you could do. So that's why you tend to see a lot of black. But certainly we know from wardrobe accounts and other sources that hats did exist in other colours. Red was the next most common. And you will have seen that the hats that I've been talking about are definitely upper class hats. If you are doing middle class, then you really, these are not the sort of hats that you're going to be seeing in the images. So the kinds of hats that you want to be making, except possibly a sombrero. A sombrero, I think you could make this way and it would work really well. But most of the middle class hats are ones that are actually formed felt hats, or they're the ones that I spoke about earlier, which are knitted and felt. So I'm just gonna give a couple of examples of those. You can see this is a flat cap, and we saw some similar ones to these. And quite often in the images, you'll see these little lines here, where you can see those you know that basically that's going to be a knitted cap so this has been knitted and then it's been filtered down this one was made by mistress miriam um, and it's a fabulous hat and here is an even more elaborate version of the hat and this was made by mistress ginevra and again it's been knitted in one piece and then filtered down so if that's the right style of hat it's quite difficult to make it in any other way. You can make a sewn version in woolen fabric. You can see here I've made um, a hat of the Mediagora type in, in the fabric, but it won't ever have quite the same effect. You can see the lines on it. However, 
it's still a good solution and much better than not wearing a hat at all. And it's the same process. You want to pad up the hat form and then you want to be using, um, uh, I would use paper for this one because you want some softness um, to mimic the, the wool. Make it up as the pattern, try it on. If you like it in the, in the paper, the cardboard version, make it up. We have a question whether you ha have any information um, about the hat worn by Juana of Aragon in the portrait by Titian. I know that's a very spe specific question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't immediately bring that hat to mind, but uh, if you've got any specific questions that we aren't able to address in this class, I'm really happy for people to contact me directly and send me a picture of a hat and ask me questions about how I think that was made. Um, there is a group in Lockhart called Lockhart Lids, which is all about hats and headwear, and it has quite a lot of people from other kingdoms in it as well these days. So if you, if you want to do it through that, or as I said, contact me directly, feel free. I want to... And that is ornamentation on hats. Many of the hats that we saw had elaboration. So they were embroidered or they had pearls or they had uh, other kinds of fancy things. When you're looking at the hat, think about those decorative elements and break them down. Quite often they look really elaborate, but are in fact built up of multiple layers. And that could be things like shiny gold fittings, and you can add bits to those shiny gold fittings to make them look shinier. So you can add jewels, or pearls, aglets, braid, this kind of uh, three cord braid in multiple colors, very, very common and very easy to buy in a furnishing department. And there are other braids in the furnishing department that are worth looking out too. Another place where I get a lot of my materials is from charity shops, thrift shops. I always look through and see if they've got a craft section and you can often buy handfuls of old braid and old furnishing braid for very little. Spain, of course, you get this amazing bobble stuff, which has become fashionable again. So you can now buy that again by the meter and that makes um, many hats easier to make. Feathers too. Here's the band of a hat that, that I made for Nico, which I will temporarily put on this hat so you can see. So this looks quite elaborate, but is in fact not that hard to make. So I've got a velvet ribbon to which I've attached a series of gold mounts and I've sewn a single pearl into the middle of each one. And then I have a, a shield shape, which I picked up in a $2 store uh, as a piece of junk jewelry on which I've glued a couple more pearls. And then it has a feather coming out of the top. So that it looks like quite an elaborate result, but it was made up of very simple materials. Um, somebody asked whether you used the individual bubbles on that sort of strip of bubbles or whether you attached the, the, attach the whole strip. You attach the whole strip. Um, on the examples that, that you see, you can see the line of colour and then you can see the bubbles depending which are in the same colour. So my interpretation of that would be this is how it's made. So how this would have been made in period is probably that this top ribbon here would have been um, possibly tablet woven, but probably more likely um, woven in a band loom. And these would have been done as extensions off the bottom of that. And that would go around the brim or the crown? Yes, you see the examples that I've seen where that's used is around the brim. But don't, don't make a hat like that because I said that find an image of it and then base the hat, the proportions, the decorations and so on, on the image. 
Thanks very much, Owen. Um, I think we're just coming on to um, 10 to, to the hour. Um, so it is kind of time to start winding up, but I've, you've clearly got something else to show us. I and, do. Um, I do have so one more thing to show you. That, and then, I'll, then I might, um, we'll take a little short break. So. so the last thing that I wanted to show you is when you're covering a hat, several of the tall hats that I showed you, you could see the pleats coming down the hat. And I wanted to show you the easy way of doing that, which is that obviously you measure the amount that you need from the side across and back down to the side and from the front across and back down to the end, because the hat is an oval, this will be an oval. And then you divide that space up on the back into 16, use your ruler, and make it a star of 16 and then use and I've done this in yellow so you can see it then use two threads to go round and just pick up a little bit of thread on each one of those when you put that over the hat and draw it up that will give you very nice even pleats all the way around the hat then you base that to the bottom of the hat, trim off any excess and cover it with the hat band. That will give you a very good looking hat. That's a great tip, Rowan. Very much appreciate that. And I have to tell you, everybody is just raving to you about your sewing room and the and and in, in serious lust about your, your background. <laughs> yes, my wonderful drawers of stuff. <laughs> Okay, um, I think we, I might un unmute everyone so that you can, we can all chat and um, and if anyone, uh, you're going to stick around for a moment or two, I think, and so anyone can, can ask questions, I guess. Just to remind everyone that this has been recorded and will be available up on YouTube and to um, take this opportunity to thank Rowan for her time um, for a really, really excellent class. I know that everyone here will have got a huge amount out of it. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, I'm happy to stay around for the next, um, until we're ready for the next class and talk about hats and show you some more hats. Rowan? Yes. Hi, it's Juana. Um, hi, Juana. Hi. Um, my husband has been doing a lot of block felt hats and has figured out a relatively economical way of making blocks. Um, mm -hmm that are shaped to whatever he wants. He's got a particular uh, period manuscript and he is in the process of doing all the men's hats in that book. Um, but if anybody is interested in doing blocked felt hats and they want to press the button and have him go blah at, him, at them, this can be arranged. Yes, please. No, I, 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 was going, I was going to do... I, I had yeah, like that I wanted to talk on block hats, but I couldn't fit that into the time period that I had for this one. So, other things. And I know that um, uh, Illuminata really wanted to show her hat. So, Illuminata, are you still there? And do you want to um, show, show us all your hat? Disappeared for the moment. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Okay. I'll show you a couple more hats. Um, in the meantime, until somebody else wants to ask a question. So this is a flat hat type style. So this one has felt on the brim, but this one has, has the velvet at the top. Jerris as its next. Someone is talking over you. Can I have that question again? That's okay. Okay. And here is the, the style of hat which they called um, Flemish. So this one has a brim which is made in sections. And again, the, the brim sections here are the, the felt, which is then covered. And then it has a soft crown on top. Um, and that's uh, a way of achieving that particular kind of hat. Okay, I think we probably need to take a break now um, just so that we've got a smooth transition to our next class. But so thank you again for your time. It's been great.